to hear from, about the Alaska Native Science and Engineering Program, which I was lucky enough to hear a lot about last evening. Very inspiring. Hi, I'm Herb Schroeder. Thanks for inviting us to come here. Uh, when I started ANSEP in 1995, I had received a $100,000 donation for scholarships for engineers who had happened to be Alaska Natives. And my boss, I was a new professor, the dean of the school came in, <clears throat> closed the office door, and said, we're going to send this money back. We're not going to dumb our school down and have a bunch of Alaska Natives here. And I was stunned. I didn't know what to do about this. And uh, I took it up through the administration, and everybody's attitude was kind of so. And uh, we looked, and we found that uh, in the previous 15 years, only two students had ever graduated uh, from our school who had been Alaska Native. And I looked at the preparation level for the students that were coming in, and all of them were about like eighth graders. <clears throat> I went around to schools in the state, uh, the state's very isolated. I can ride a snow machine from near my house for 700 miles and never cross a road. And uh, so this, uh, I went to the, these different schools. There's 400 villages around the state. And I was met with exactly the same attitude by the people who were running the schools. The attitude was, these kids can never do that. They don't have the intellectual capacity to do that. Um, there's other systemic problems. Uh, excuse me, other systemic problems involved. Uh, Alaska Native people are the poorest people, poorest demographic in the nation, and that extends into the urban centers in Alaska. Uh, when we started in 95, we had students in our program who were, whose parents were the first generation of people to ever use money. And they were making this transition from a bartering uh, kind of uh, a bartering system into a monetary system. Even today, in 2017, with all the success we've had at ANSEP, 98% uh, of the kids who are Alaska Native who come into our university will need to take a remedial course. And students, of the students who take remedial courses, only 5% ever earn a certificate or degree. And we've totally turned that around for the kids to participate in our program and what we're demonstrating is the importance of investing early. Uh, we start with kids in fifth and sixth grade. We invest early and get them inspired and then work with them every single year until they can earn a PhD if they want. We have two Alaska Natives on our faculty in the College of Engineering now who come through our program. And it's all the way. And I, I, want it, I would like it to be all Alaska Native. I'm just uh, kind of because of the situation I was confronted with when I started. The Urban Institute found that there's no comparable program in the nation and that the ANSEP students uh, outperform all students on the average in the nation. Hello, Michael Borikowski, ANSEP alumni, and, and I work with Herb with ANSEP. So, um, so through place-based, experiential, collaborative, fun, and challenging experiences, we begin working with students as early as sixth grade and provide annual opportunities to work with us through middle school, through high school, and into university undergraduate and graduate degree programs. Um, as Herb mentioned, we started with just one student in 1995, and now we have over 2,500 students across Alaska from sixth grade through the PhD, and 600 alumni who are working in the oil and gas industry with state and federal agencies and in education. So by inspiring students early and providing guidance along their academic pathways and providing multiple opportunities to prepare academically, socially, and professionally for college and careers. ANSEP is improving academic outcomes. We're eliminating the need for university remediation and the associated costs to the government and the students and families. We're saving the students up to two years of college education costs. We're saving the state millions in, in government funding because we're reducing that time to a college degree and providing the students the opportunity to earn up to two years of college credits toward a variety of different baccalaureate degree programs while in high school. And so one of the, so for example, some of the things we're doing, we build computers with 50 middle school students at a time, half boys, half girls, and they assemble all the parts and pieces they need for the computer to get it up and running, 
download the operating system and the software, and ultimately they get to take this computer home with them. Their goal is to finish Algebra 1 by the end of 8th grade. And so 77% of our ANSEP students are reaching that goal. Nationally, only 26% of students of all ethnicities and genders finish Algebra 1 by the end of 8th grade. At the high school level, our students are taking college courses taught by university professors for both college and high school credit. And our university students benefit from a community on the campus that supports them academically uh, by pro providing peer networking, peer academic study groups, professional networking opportunities, um, as well as financial aid opportunities. And so what we've done is use the funding from our strategic partners to be able to demonstrate the effectiveness of what we're doing from middle school through university and being able to transition to federal and state funding support. Thank you so much. That, it's, it's really terrific. <laughs> students outperform students on every measure at every educational level. Could you say a little bit more about that? So I know about the algebra completion rate, but other measures as well. Yeah, so there's the algebra completion rate, and then uh, we have students who are graduating from high school who have completed advanced engineering math because of the way we bring them in from, even from rural communities into our campus in the summertime. Mm -hmm. And now we've started our own high schools uh, in, that are on the road system. Uh, we're we're going to transition to residential high schools, but uh, in those high schools, kids graduate with two full years of real college credits that count toward bachelor of science degrees in engineering or science. So that saves, uh, between states and families, about $54,000 uh, per student. Thank you. Just a couple data points I was trying to, uh, as I was going back through the, uh, through the proposal. So how many students are being served a year? What's the size of your budget? I know you have numerous grants, yeah. all, all of which is leading to a last question about sustainability. Yeah, so we're adding uh, this year 500 new middle school students. And that, as we bring more partners on in, from the school district partners, uh, we continue to add more and more students every year. That's back at the beginning of the pipeline. So we've got this slug of kids that are in K-12. We started that in 2010 with just one of those middle school academies. But this slug of students, and we have 200 kids that are going to transition to the university next year in a few years. So in seven years, those 500 kids this year, they'll, they'll be ready to go to the university. And uh, what's happening is when they show up at the university, they're only spending about two years and two and a half years because they're so prepared. It's a $10 million a year budget, uh, and it's a mix of uh, federal money, state money, uh, private money, and philanthropic funds. Uh, and one other, other statistic I forgot to mention is 75% of our kids who come in the university mm -hmm. uh, continue on uh, or gra and graduate with a STEM degree. How do you identify the, the, the sixth graders? Uh, and how do people get into the, the system? So now at this point, we have about a dozen different school district partners who have been motivated and excited and inspired through their middle school student experience. And so they're helping us to identify and recruit their students. So primarily, when we initially started out, it was we're traveling to all these communities to try to promote this opportunity. But we've built up so much momentum since running middle school programs since 2010 that now these districts are seeking us out. And they're saying, how can we get our kids involved? So they're, they're coming to the table as opposed to us having to influence or convince them to want to participate. So once they get buying in and they see how it inspires the students, how it prepares and motivates the students about their attitude toward education, making cool school, or yeah, making school cool. <laughs> and uh, it's really, I think, started to take a, a momentum of its own. And so now these districts are helping us to identify and recruit students. And can, can any sixth grader in a participating district come in? Or is it, or, and I may have missed it, I apologize. Or are there eligi some sort of eligibility requirements that take in particular students in a district? So there's an application process, of course. And, and so we're looking for students who to, to fill out this application 
we have tangible goals, academic goals of having A or B in math or science classes on track to finish algebra or can get on track to finish algebra. And so what we're trying to do is, is help those students and those parents and families understand how these little short-term, relatively short-term academic goals are going to lead to continuing opportunities later on down the road along their academic pathway. Yeah, um, one more thing on sustainability, I didn't answer the question. Uh, there's plenty of money in the system uh, to do what needs to be done to produce the results that we need, but the money isn't being spent in a way that produces those results. And, uh, you know, we do this with these kids who are the poorest kids in the nation, who are isolated and don't have the opportunities in education. And the National Science Foundation came to us last year and asked us if we would host a meeting and we brought people from inner cities and from uh, uh, down in Louisiana, Alabama, uh, Hispanic communities from the Southwest, uh, Indian communities from the Plain States, uh, Hawaiians, and we had to bring teams of 10 people that we felt they needed to be able to replicate the work that we do in Alaska in their communities. And those things are starting to start, starting up around the country now. But the, the real key to it is you have to rebuild the culture. You I can't, thought you made them all rebuild the computer. Well, they, we did. <laughs> the very first thing we made everybody do when they showed up was build a computer. And we had sixth graders show them how to do it, which was really fun. <laughs> but the, the secret to it is, is rebuilding the culture. And you can't start in the middle. You have to go back and show children the possibilities for their lives before they get beat down by people who are telling them that well, they, can't. they can't do this, you know? And it, yeah. Thank you. Well, I want to know, all those people who said the Alaskans were stupid, have they come back? Have they said we were wrong, or they admitted anything? No. <laughs> Strangely. Strangely. No. You know, it's, um, people for years and years, from 1995 to about 2010, were convinced we were cheating somehow and lying, and, and we were just going, but here's the kid, you know? And, uh, it, you know, even people were, were, you know, we couldn't believe it. So what we did was one of our... Our benefactors gave us a half a million dollars to hire the Urban Institute to come and do this exhaustive analysis. And if you ever work with an organization like that, they send in a SWAT team of PhDs and uh, spent 18 months going through everything. And uh, we had been, or I'd been careful not to report our, our total retention rates, like 75%. I was saying it was more like 60, was sandbagging. And, Urban Institute came and said, well, it's actually 75% and it's 77% and it just shut everybody up. Great. Yeah. So, so in, just in terms of uh, sustainability, are, are there voices within Alaska saying, well, we're focusing these resources on native Alaskans, uh, giving too much? Question one, and then related to that, is this program having an effect on education more broadly, right? In other words, yes, this intensive is. investment in middle schoolers going forward. Right, and that, that's part of our challenge is that uh, when we bring those kids in, we make sure we bring teachers and counselors from, our, from their schools so that they begin to see the kids in a different way. And uh, not all of our kids are Alaska Native. What we find is that all the minority people in Alaska have a tendency to gravitate into our program. And uh, there's even uh, a lot of white kids that sh show up for our program. And we don't turn anybody down. It's, uh, so it's, it's not exclusive just for last names. But uh, people, you know, they still, there's still people that we have to convince uh, going forward that it's important to invest early. Uh, when you get a new governor, governors always end up at ANSEP when they get elected. And, uh, you know, they want to see something happen in four years. And if you invest in a kid in middle school, it's at least, you know, you're looking at 10 or 11 or 12 years before they get a degree. So, but um, now, since we've been doing this since 2010, we're starting to make some headway there. The governor was in our building yesterday because he's interested in what we're doing. Yeah. Good. Oh, that's very, very good. Yeah. But, and why... Uh, why could I mean, $10 million is some money, but it's not that much money. No. 
So really, you should get more money. Well, <laughs> I agree. You know, if you, if you look at there's a thousand kids a year that come into the University of Alaska and need remediation. Yeah. And uh, it's about $25,000 per year per student. And so you're spending all this money, and only 5% of those students ever earn a certificate or degree. So that's money that's just not to mention the $18,000 per year per student in the K-12 system who graduate thinking they're ready for college, and then they have to be remediated. Right. And then the social problems that result from the failure and the, the feelings of failure and low self-esteem from being told you're ready to go to college and go to college and fail and go back home. This is, you know, so we're dealing with all these issues on all these different fronts and I had no idea when I started. I just wanted to make some native engineers. Well, thank you very much. I hope um, that lots of people in Alaska celebrate you and that throughout the country they take up your really good thank example. You. Thank you.